Okay. So, well, first of all, I would like to thank uh, so much to Natasha and well, everyone who made this uh, this uh, conference on Platia possible. Thank you very much. Thank you as well to uh, all the panelists for this set of uh, really fascinating per papers in the previous days. And well, I would like to apologize as well for, for missing the first day of the conference. I was um, flying to London where I am right now. So apologies if I, I, I accidentally repeat anything that has been already discussed. So um, I get to the point. Uh, my paper deals with the behavior of the Greek allies um, at Plataea. But in a sense, it is also concerned about modern uh, expectations and assessments of ancient behavior in combat. Um, I will somehow build up upon yesterday's discussion on professionalism um, in the sense that it is also a modern concept that uh, generates modern expectations, just like uh, our modern assessment of the Greeks' performance at the Battle of Plataea. So I would like to start, um, if, if possible, uh, with the, this uh, sentences, sentence by Lazenby. Sorry, uh, presentation needs to... Okay, this um, sentence by Lazenby, which uh, summarizes in a sense modern attitudes towards what happened at the battle. Um, a combination of bad planning, poor execution, and a pile of organizational problems. So uh, by Greek standards, Plataea was an uncommon battle. It lasted several days. It had several tactical deployments on both sides. Uh, it was fought with some of the expected forces on the Greek uh, side still missing. Uh, and at times, neither side uh, seemed to really want to take the initiative. However, I believe that the main reason of our puzzlement, I would say, with this battle, the seemingly uncoordinated movements of the Greek units was not an uncommon phenomenon at all. And this is what I will try to argue here, uh, that uh, what happened in the last phase of Plataea was most certainly not what Pausanias had in mind, but it was pretty much what he could have expected. I believe that by addressing the challenges and troubles of managing Greek allied armies in campaign at Plataea and elsewhere in the classical period, we realize that the reason lies not so much on the amateurism and alleged lack of discipline of the Greeks, which is our modern expectation, as on the nature of Greek alliances and the autonomy that is the independent decision-making of the communities involved. Uh, so let's start with uh, the battle itself. So we all know the stats. According to Herodotus, the heavy infantry came close to 40,000 men, uh, while the light infantry could reach some additional 40 to 70,000 men, depending on how many helots we are ready to accept. They were coming from 31 different political communities, and there was an overall Spartan leadership. So this was certainly no minor challenge to, uh, in terms of uh, logistics, mobilization, and coordination. And those problems became evident throughout the entire campaign. However, two different issues stand out neatly from uh, Herodotus's narrative of the events. First, the individual communities seem to be constantly pushing the boundaries of collective initiative and pursuing individual aims and goals. And second, the leader of the campaign, Pausanias, is shown constantly negotiating and bargaining, not really compelling or commanding a common ground with his allies. So let's take a closer look. Uh, as we know, the Greeks went uh, through three different positions before finally engaging the Persians. At the first position, right uh, after the first contact uh, with the enemy cavalry, the Megarians threatened to quit their posts if they were not assisted by the allies. Pausanias then uh, consulted the allies, asking for volunteers, uh, and only the Athenians stepped forward, sending a detachment of 300 picked men. But then when they saw themselves in trouble, uh, they called uh, for the rest of the Athenian force. I think uh, in this case, then Allen Stratian can be interpreted to mean the rest of the Athenian contingent. So they were also acting uh, on their own initiative. Uh, when the Greeks uh, got, get to the second position, Herodotus describes uh, their battle order in detail, which would, would be uh, as presented in this list. Uh, and then came the argument between the Athenians and the Aegeans on account of the right wing, uh, uh, which uh, Herodotus describes. And both Green and Lazenby reject the anecdote onto grounds. First, suspicion of being, uh, of being a pro-Athenian story fabricated later to grant the Athenians a greater role in the battle. 
and second, the fact that the discussion changed nothing and the units stayed in their original posts. However, although the details of the episode can be disputed, it reflects realistically, in my opinion, the tensions between individual allies on different grounds, uh, such as status and recognition, and the existence of quarrels of such nature. And also from this stage, uh, Plutarch reports an obscure plot uh, within the Athenian contingent intended to, uh, quote, harm the Greek cause and overthrow democracy, end quote, which Aristides is forced to dismantle with a great deal of negotiation. There are dots, obviously, regarding this episode, which is not to be found in Herodotus, but it again represents the Allies as restless and prone to act on their own, um, on their own initiative. However, the most serious incidents happened uh, during the night withdrawal to the third position. Uh, according to Herodotus, there was a plan to converge on the island, but things unfolded in a peculiar way. Both wings stayed put for different reasons, uh, while the center, the only section of the army that started the, the, the withdrawal on time, ended up in the wrong place, much closer to the city of Plataea than expected. Meanwhile, the Spartans had some troubles with one of their units commanded by a certain among Faretos. We had a really long and interesting discussion about that, uh, delaying the retreat of the entire uh, Lacedaemonian contingent. The Athenians, instead of starting their own retreat, were still waiting for instructions. But then uh, uh, when Pausanias asked them to move in the same uh, direction of the, as, uh, as uh, the Spartan contingent towards the Citeron, they did exactly the opposite, going down to the plane in order to close the gap between both uh, units. That's not all. Uh, when the Persians finally attacked, the Tegeans, uh, well, that's the, that's the, the relevant text. Uh, the Tegeans then um, broke the line on their own account, forcing the rest of the formation to advance as well. The center, meanwhile, uh, barely took part uh, in the battle, participating only in small groups. The Megarians and Phliatians offered some relief to the Athenians, but were severely decimated, while the Corinthians reinforced the Spartan left flank. The final pursuit of the defeated Persians was also in disorder. Uh, we have, well, I have this uh, uh, more or less uh, sketched here. Um, while the Mantineans uh, and Eleans arrived too late once the battle was already over. So this set of tactical misfortunes has obviously drawn considerable attention and prompted some harsh judgments about the Greek performance at the battle. Modern scholars tend to agree on a combination of lack of skill and night disorientation to explain the many incidents. And many, such as Green and Lazenby, assume that there was a plan, but that it went terribly wrong. Despite these attempts at justifying the behavior of the Greeks, scholarship has traditionally felt uneasy explaining what happened, and even Lazenby found it puzzling, as we can see uh, in the uh, slide. The whole discussion betrays very low expectation, I would say, about Greek morale and discipline, and a complete disregard for Herodotus' explanation, which emphasizes autonomous initiative and self-interest, as we shall see later on. The Greeks had considerable experience coordinating allied armies. Uh, there are literary traditions uh, that inform uh, of numerous early conflicts and campaigns uh, fought by coalitions of forces from different communities, as we can see in this cursory list. True, most details of these early wars are highly, highly problematic, so we cannot assume that the internal dynamics of those literary coalitions were the same as the early 5th century ones, but they are at least revealing um, of the early tendency among the Greeks which is out of question, towards engaging in collective initiatives. The same happens in, this, in the years previous uh, to the Persian Wars. The Spartan led uh, the Peloponnesian allies against Athens in 506, and again in 494 against Argos, while the Ionians fought a general rebellion against the Persians with an Ath Athenian and Eritrean help in the so-called Ionian Revolt. So the Greeks certainly had a long experience coordinating uh, military efforts. Uh, um, Nielsen and Schwartz uh, also um, um, uh, argued that that experience was already um, um, uh, in, in, in shape in, for the Western Greeks by the end of the sixth uh, century. Um, the scale of Greek mobilization at Plataea was no doubt unprecedented, and that certainly determined their failure to coordinate successfully. However, 
The difference between Plataea and previous, and I would say later, the Greek initiatives uh, is of quantitative and not qualitative nature. So I don't think lack of experience or even lack of skill can account for what happened there. I believe we should be looking elsewhere to the nature and internal workings of the Greek alliances and to the autonomy and self-interest of the allies within those collective enterprises. And for that, we can turn to the classical period. Uh, battles in the classical period confirm uh, that what happened at Plataea was not exceptional. Individual communities consistently took autonomous decisions in combat, even from the very moment of deployment. For example, contingents in, in an allied army deployed in different depths and not in a standard, let's say, or homogeneous depth. The Thebans are renowned for presenting considerable deep formations, as we can see, while their allies at Nemea, the Athenians, deployed at 16 shields uh, deep. At Dilium, the different Boeotian contingents deployed in varying formations, as Thucydides says. Uh, sometimes allies could break formation on their own account, even before starting to advance, like the Ionian contingents in 397. Uh, but once already on the move, it was also possible that certain units withdrew before the first clash, as in the examples um, uh, uh, displayed. Um, the Argives fled at Mantinea, at Coronea, and at the so-called Tearless Battle. At Nemea, all the allies abandoned the Spartans at the first, in the very uh, first moment of the battle, while uh, on the other side, it was the Athenians who abandoned their allies after a little fighting in order to avoid uh, being encircled by the willing Spartan formation. And uh, finally, here at Nemea, uh, we can also confirm this autonomous behavior in Xenophon's description of the allied army drifting to the right. Far from being a mechanical process uh, of an advancing army, the drift was a clear matter of decision. Uh, first, the Thebans, as we can see in this text, uh, veered to the right in leading the advance in order to outflank the enemy with the wing. Then the Athenians, in order not to be detached from the rest of the line, followed them towards the right. And finally, the Spartans, uh, react to that maneuver and also veer to the right in leading the advance and extended the wing far beyond that of the enemy. So individual contingents seem to be taking individual decisions on the field. Dozens of uh, additional examples could be presented, uh, but what this brief overview shows is that allies can collaborate in campaign, like for example, the Theban cavalry and the Peloponnesian infantry during the Archidamian War, but they are prone to take autonomous decisions in uh, combat. In an allied army, the individual units are in fact the representation of autonomous political entities and they bear constant reminders of their autonomy. They have their own commanders, sometimes even their own equipment, they have their own protocols and routings for daily organization, and they deploy in separate units on the battlefield. Uh, let's say multinational uh, phalanx was not an undivided and continuous front of allied units stitched uh, together, but a broken line with gaps between the different national contingents as it is broadly assumed. How wide uh, were those gaps? We cannot uh, estimate, but they were uh, the ultimate reminder, I would say, of the autonomy of the citizen militia of an independent community. So the individual allies uh, retained and exercised their autonomy at all times. And merging into a coalition meant a careful negotiation among them to ensure that their autonomy was properly respected. Um, from the point of view of command, that meant that allies could not be given straight orders. Uh, they had to be persuaded and long-standing discussions were the norm. What this reliance on persuasion is betraying is that the nature of interstate uh, hierarchies in Greek military alliances was not uh, primarily based on command, uh, that is on coercion, but on leadership. And leadership meant that the allies trusted one of them to provide initiative and to be responsible for the general planning of the concerted efforts, like when the Spartans, uh, the Spartan commanders make their arrangements before the Battle of Nemea, as uh, Xenophon describes in this text. This episode connects uh, with something also discussed yesterday, which is order. And, but order is part of the responsibilities of military leadership since uh, the, uh, Homer. Uh, the cosmetores laon uh, we can find in the Iliad, and uh, while well, the verb tasso we can find here in this text uh, is the classical counterpart of the Hors uh, Homeric cosmeo, I guess. And um, um, 
order is only concerned with uh, special arrangement or distribution of troops, not with discipline or obedience. So even when the allies could, uh, so even then the allies could decide not to accept the decision of the leaders as we have seen. Uh, so uh, in, in my opinion, modern presentations of Greek coalitions are hierarchical structures with an undisputed political leader and a set of allies forced to follow orders. Mm, they seem to me to a great extent uh, a kind of uh, overstatements. At Plataea, uh, Pausanias is constantly negotiating with the allies, consulting the allied generals to take decisions and using persuasion and not force to make them do anything. For example, when he needs volunteers to assist the Megarians, when he's not able to avoid the quarrel between Athenians and Tegeans, or when he consults the allied generals to move uh, to the second position and then to withdraw uh, days later to the island. Leadership meant persuasion, but allies were prone, or at least able, to disagree. That is exactly what uh, Herodotus says that happened at Plataea. Uh, the allies decided uh, what they thought best for their interests and acted accordingly. Uh, in my mind, it is puzzling that this simple but extremely plausible interpretation tends to be overlooked or amended. So um, the Hellenic alliance that faced Xerxes is a perfect example uh, of those unstable and temporary collaborations among independent communities that we call Greek coalitions. The allies relied on the skills and charisma of a leader in order to operate, but retained their autonomy, self-interest and initiative. We all know about the hardships uh, the allies had to endure to get to a sort of understanding in face of the Persian invasion, something Herodotus makes crystal clear. There was no unanimity among the Greek communities to give earth and water, and uh, not all of them understood that the entire Greece was in danger the first decision taken by the resisting Greeks was to end the existing wars and quarrels among them, but they still had uh, troubles to bring new allies to their side and the important powers such as Argos, Corthyra, or the Greek cities in Crete and Sicily hesitated or refused based on particular interests. The first meeting of the alliance took place in Corinth when Xerxes was already uh, close to uh, across the Hellespont. Uh, the path to the Hellenic League was hard and troublesome. If we follow Herodotus, there was no internal structure to sustain the alliance apart from the shared uh, feeling of being concerned about the general welfare uh, of Hellas or being conured against the Persians. So there is no detailed contemporary information about the nature or structure of the Hellenic alliance. But we have later evidence for multinational alliances and what they provide is uh, in my opinion, a fitting image of this uh, barely hierarchical structure in which the allies preserve their autonomy and initiative. Uh, the famous treaty between the Athenians, Eleans, Mantineans, and Argives in 419 provides an interesting example. It bans all armed conflict between the allies, it stipulates mutual assistance in case of invasion, it establishes collective decision for matters such as interrupting hostilities against a third party or granting armed groups safe passage across the territory of the allies. It regulates the payment of alimonies to any allied troops, and it declares the oaths to be taken by the members and their allies. There is one single clause regulating the structure of command, and it reads as follows. The city sending for the troops shall have the command when the war is um, in his own country. But in case of the city resolving upon a joint expedition, the command shall be equally divided among all the cities. So in conclusion, uh, I think it is fair to say that disobedience can, be, uh, can only be claimed when obedience is due. And that was not the case with Greek allies in multinational coalitions. True, the erratic and autonomous behavior of the Greek allies at Plataea and elsewhere throughout Greek history jeopardized collective initiatives and put everyone at risk. Uh, but that was really the primary concern of independent communities that cared first and foremost for their own interests. Some of them, moreover, had been at war with each other in the past, and most of them actually disliked and distrusted each other deeply and unrelentingly. Leadership, as the example of Sparta on the eve of the Peloponnesian War shows in this text, was a matter of persuasion rather than of coercion, so the allies could not be pushed too hard or too far especially if there was some balance of power between them. 
I think this decentralized nature of Greek alliances makes better sense of what happened to the Greek allies at Plataea. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this, uh, this, most, this most interesting talk. Um, I think it's a, it's a very salutary reminder that coalition warfare in point of fact was, if not the norm, uh, then rather than the exception, then at least a very central phenomenon in, in late archaic and classical Greek warfare. Um, this, I suppose, will have stimulated, will have uh, sparked some interest. And the question is, Paul Badunius. Um, How are you doing? Uh, one of the things that I've, I've found most interesting in, in your work in the past is the stress on the concept of sort of parataxis, Thucydides parataxis instead of phalanx, right? So phalanx is a single structure. Parataxis are a bunch of taxis uh, lined up alongside, right? That, that autonomy, I think, is crucial to understanding what's happening. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that today. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, uh, I think it's even in, in within um, big communities such as Athens, and it's it's pretty easy to find those in, um, differentiated, let's say, units uh, operate. Uh, we obviously don't know how uh, independent those, let's say, um, uh, national contingents were, but obviously in, in uh, um, within those coalitions of uh, different uh, Greek uh, communities, I think it's uh, obvious, or at least it's very relevant to say that they were pretty independent or autonomous when they were taking their own um, decisions. And I mean, you see, even in, in combat, there'll be alternate fates of units that are standing right next to each other, right? So yes. somewhere on the line, somebody's winning and somebody's losing yes. right to their exactly. left, right? Exactly. Oh, yeah. exactly. So they actually, they react to that, uh, to that specific situation. And some of them are leaving the ground and they're just retreating and the others are just uh, standing. So, yeah. Yeah, when you see the, the failure to exploit the gap, for instance, at Mathenae, I, yeah. I, I, I often think about what is the ethos? Is the ethos just, I got to fight the taxes on the other side, essentially almost man-to-man -to -man combat, but played out by communities. Because uh, there seems to be no thought to doing anything other than that, right? Fighting your battle and you're done. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, so next on the, uh, the, on the list is, uh, is Ian, I think. Yeah, I actually had just a basic question. I, I think you've done a really good job of assembling a lot of different evidence to a lot of different angles. One of the things that I was really struck mm -hmm. by is you kind of have to go recourse to, you know, Thucydides and Xenophon quite a lot. I'm wondering, as we are going into this Herodotus thing, how aware do you think Herodotus was of the dynamics? I think you're quite right, but oh, it looks like my internet's bad. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, I was a little, uh, I missed a little bit of the question, if you don't mind to repeat it. <laughs> How, how yeah, far just, um, just was aware basically of, just how aware, yeah, how aware was Herodotus of the dynamic that you're describing? Uh, I think he was fully aware. I mean, uh, I, I think he understood that uh, the Greek communities were in, in, I mean, they were able to make independent decisions. So, and, and he's not questioning that at all uh, at, at any time. I don't think the expectation was either Herodotus or even Pausanias' expectations were um, um, uh, complete order and complete obedience. Uh, I think the expectation was just loyalty <laughs> to the oaths and to the, the promises. Uh, but they were obviously ready to understand uh, how different communities could <laughs> do exactly the opposite or uh, what, whatever suit them uh, best in the, in the precise moment. So I think, he, I think he was fully aware of that. I mean, it was pretty clear in the late uh, 5th century when he was uh, writing or composing his, his work. I think that was... Okay, next up is uh, Hans Beck. Well, thank you, Fernando. Um, <clears throat> that you. was really terrific and, and clearing up that battlefield for me in, in so many ways, questions that I would, uh, uh, that I've asked myself and I never had the abilities uh, uh, to, to really understand these things. So thank you very much. Um, I was recently asked to contribute something to a, to a, to a museum catalog 
on a horse exhibit and they wanted me to do something on ancient on Greek cavalries. Um, again, steep learning curve, but interesting uh, indeed. And I mean, let's also keep in mind that when we talk about order on the battlefield, that Plataea is probably the greatest encounter, the first great encounter of the Greeks with a massive cavalry that really scares the hell out of them. In Herodotus's depiction, the quick movement of, um, of, of the Persian cavalry during the battle is a matter of significant disturbance when it comes to order and non-order. Mm -hmm. And the battle begins with Persians parading over the battlefield and uh, trying to lure the Greeks into battle. And again, the Greeks are worried, and that's what Herodotus says, of course, um, that this is a, a moment of, of uh, it's a new experience in many ways, not with the horse warfare as such, but the magnitude of what happens mm -hmm. there and the militarization of the horse body and how this is happening in the enemy lines with perfection, as it were. So I think that's also an, a critical thing to keep in mind that those multinational um, Greek troops um, are, are simply puzzled by what happens um, both before and during the battle. Thank you again for now. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, I think well, that's pretty much uh, Royal's uh, uh, thesis or idea, and in, in a very recent paper. And uh, so Royal can probably explain that much better than I do. Uh, that that the, the Greek hoplites were scared to death of, of uh, cavalry, and uh, but in that case, and within my um, talk, I think that would provide the the let's say the ultimate cause or let's say the the um uh the trigger uh to you know to uh probably to justify the decision of a national contingent to stay put or retreat uh so we are scared of the cavalry so let's go in uh, no matter what they told us to do just let uh just so we need to retreat we need to uh, yeah, but obviously, I'm probably Roel can can say a lot more about this uh, than 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 myself. I mean, I would just say, I mean, the, the inscription that Hans brought up yesterday, where uh, the Megarians specifically uh, put up a monument to say we fought cavalry, which is such a telling <laughs> little monument that just says like it was really scary. Good. Like this is a particularly worthy of note that we stood up to the horsemen. Right, so David Yates. Yeah, so I'm I'm uh, I love the paper. I'm completely persuaded. I think that's definitely the dynamic. Um, I also thought it was it was very interesting to, to point out that the 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 difficulties and the dynamics at play in Plataea would have been anticipatable, right? And some of the campaigns you, the Greeks have done this before, but two of the examples you have the Spartans in, against Athens in 506, and of course famously the <laughs> the Ionian Revolt. They both end as as flaming disasters because of the very dynamics you're pointing out. And I'm wondering if, if, if when we put those together, if we can shed light on the larger strategic question, right? So, I mean, the, to much to the Athenians' dismay and lament, the Spartans are incredibly reluctant to lead a massive Peloponnesian army out. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if we can begin to think through some of that reluctance, because in 506, they know exactly what it means to take an enormous army like this out and how much you are risking on this issue of persuasion there, so I think I, I think there's there's a tactical, you know, we get a lot of insight there, but I think if we broaden it out, I, I I would say that I think your your thesis gives us some some really much needed light on some other issues as well. Sorry, that was more of a comment than a question. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, no, I agree. I totally agree. It would be really, uh, I don't know, really troublesome to 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 start putting those alliances in motion and 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 start the the, the persuasion, start to be in persuasion mode, let's say, and and bring all the allies together to do something. And uh, probably the round of discussions and, uh, and agreements to be taken and probably it was worse than anything, or not worse than anything and anything else, obviously, but really, really, uh, well, really difficult probably, yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Adam. Thank you so much, Fernanda, for the most interesting paper. Uh, I have a question, um, particularly about the gaps between 
different contingents because of course this is just fantastically interesting to think through uh, with our thoughts about how phalanx worked right so um let me see what i so essentially somehow when i'm thinking about uh, uh the famous description that Thucydides does at the battle of Mantinea mm -hmm. of the drifting to the right that drifting seems sort of like give this extremely physical uh sense of just sort of like the necessary drifting to keep mm -hmm. being um mm -hmm. covered it, but then at the battle of Nemea um this uh somehow like they still the uh Lysidamo like so the Lysidamonians follow the mm, Tegeans but uh perhaps not sort of like in this physical sense of that like where the last Tegeans and the next Spartan starts but they still somehow have um they, mm -hmm. they feel that they need to keep moving right mm -hmm. So this is one um, question, which is just general uh, phalanx operation. And the second one, if we think about gaps between the contingents um, of different uh, city states, then why would be so? Why would we be so worried by uh, one city state? Sort of, you know, we have been speaking about. Uh, different units and sending uh, one unit out and then somehow like whether it opens a gap in the phalanx. So if the phalanxes were so gapy anyways, why would it be um, a problem? And the third comment is, so sorry, just to okay. sort of like thinking about the autonomy, I am coming back obsessively to Amon Faretos and Posanias and thinking that that's also sort of the same dynamic just on the uh, level of one city state of the persuasion versus uh, just straight command. Okay, so let's start with the gaps. Uh, and uh, well, as I said, I'm, I mean, we, we cannot, uh, uh, we cannot estimate uh, how wide were those gaps between the, but we assume, I, I think it's generally assumed, and it's not only myself, it's a, from everyone I've read so far agrees that there must be some gaps between the national contingents. Uh, probably wide enough to allow those units certain freedom of movement so they can detach from one another. They are not connected, they are not in touch somehow. But obviously not too wide in order to lead uh, or to let the enemy uh, come through. So the, the problem at Mantinea and other battles and there's uh, 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 plenty of the specialists here that can that can uh, 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 dive in. Um, the problem at Mantinea and and uh, Leuctra as well is that the, the gap is too wide. It's it's far far too wide. So uh, uh, the, the the enemy army just moves across the the, the field. So um, it's not a matter of let's say meters or uh, it's it's a matter of uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's uh, Whole uh, entire units that are missing uh, in 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 the case of Mantinea. So uh, um, that obviously puts uh, those uh, separate units in danger, and uh, they are forced to to retreat. Uh, but as we can see in Mantinea, the right wing, the Spartan right wing, continues to fight. So in a sense, they really don't need uh, uh, those left wing uh, units to, to win the battle because they eventually uh, end up winning. Um, but obviously you, you don't want a gap wide enough in order to let all the you know, enemy formation to, 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 to go through uh, your line because you can, they can uh, catch you uh, in the rear guard and, and, uh, or your or anything. Um, I was sorry. What was the last question? Um, uh, I was thinking about uh, the autonomy on the intercity state level, and sort of, I am. It's very interesting. Like when we're thinking about gaps, sort of like it would be great actually to quantify it. And uh, hello to the people in the field. Somehow, like, is like uh, a gap of uh, let's say eight shields uh, wide. Is it? We, we, we have we have troubles even to to estimate uh, what was the 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 uh, 
gap between individual uh, fighters. So <laughs> we oh, cannot, yes. also- we cannot even estimate how, how, was, how wide were those gaps between uh, units. Um, and I, I, in a sense, I think it has something to do with our idea of a phalanx as a wall. So we don't want breaches in a wall. But I don't, I'm not sure whether the Greeks uh, saw the phalanx as a wall <laughs> exactly, because it, if, it, if it was a wall, they, they had round bricks. You know what I mean? I mean, it, it's a, um, it's a, it's a very bad element to create a wall, to have round bricks. Uh, so I'm not sure they, they wanted to create a wall. They wanted to create a front, but not necessarily an, an unbroken uh, wall. So I think it, somehow it has to do with our own um, ideas of, of what an ancient uh, formation looked like, uh, which is completely lost for us. So we were just uh, bound to... to, to to speculate somehow. So I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't have a good answer for that. Probably anyone else, I don't know. Thanks so much. This is really interesting to think about. Yeah. It is. Um, in the interest of keeping time somewhat, we have time for us one final question remark from, from Christopher, and then yeah. uh, we must move on. Please remember that, that there's also time in the general discussion yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. bring all this up again, and we will. Okay, um, so, I mean, three very quick observations. First on gaps. Um, because it's interesting that in the right sort of tactical situation, um, commanders can decide that gaps are a good thing. Um, the, the, uh, the, the, the arrangement for attack that Xenophon ca- calls orthioi uh, in the Anabasis is actu- actually institutionalized as gaps. It deliberately has separate sections of troops going forward in certain tactical situations. Um, secondly, about Plataea, I mean, what you describe is, is surely correct. And the length of time they were on that field in various places must have exacerbated the effect. Mm-hmm. It's cumulative. Um, the passage of time, uh, the attacks from the cavalry, but, but the passage of time will tend to exacerbate the inclination of individual groups of people to look inward to themselves and, and not outward to the collectivity. Thirdly, it, it strikes me that this phenomenon, um, this battlefield phenomenon, casts some light, perhaps, upon um, the, the, the striving towards the creation of federal states. If you have a, federal, a true federal state, you actually create an institutional structure, which, among other things, might at least be hoped to overcome this sort of difficulty. That's the way to, to create a coalition which can have a unitary leadership um, and, and, and have that advantage. You know, that Demosthenes famously said to Philip that, that there is a single commander, he can decide what he's doing. This is exactly not true in an individual polis, never mind a coalition, because within an individual polis, there are lots of competing leaders. If you create an effective federal structure, though maybe in theory, you can create an effective coalition army. Oh, well, thank you. And that casts some light on, on the pattern yeah, yeah. Of, of, no. uh, across the 5th to 4th century of, of, of the appetite for federated structures. No, well, nothing to comment on that. I mean, I agree with the second point, particularly, I mean, the, the, the exhaustion and the attrition uh, experienced by the Greeks after long days of, of, of well, <laughs> doing nothing most of the time and being attacked and, 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 and being in danger. And regarding the, the federal state, Oh, I'm not an expert. I, I see those uh, uh, federal states more as a result of hegemonic um, um, uh, mm-hmm. dynamics, but probably uh, they're, I mean, they're useful, obviously, for coordinating military efforts more efficiently. So in a sense, that would be, let's say, instrumental. Yeah. 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 Thank you.